The title of this is What Do Penguins, Gimli, and Cobras Have to Do with Open Science? And if you want to find out what that relationship is, you sort of have to stay awake and attentive during this. Um, so my story began about seven years ago um, with this chap here. You can tell he's English, just like me, because of the terrible teeth. Um, and like most good stories, it began in a pub. And I was a master's student in London at the time at Imperial College. And I was talking to Ross here, and I was saying, you know, I'd really like to publish my master's thesis. And he said, well, you know, just make sure that it's open access. And I was like, well, what the hell is open access? And he said, well, it's where you make your research freely available to everyone. And it's like, well, doesn't everyone have access to, re oh, wait. And everything sort of like unraveled about my academic history up to that point. You know, when I was a, an undergraduate and a master's student, I would hit paywalls all the time. And it just seemed like a common everyday thing. You know, it's like, oh crap, this one's paywalled. Guess I can't use that. Move on to the next one. And the more I sort of thought about this, I realized that despite being in a ridiculously privileged position at a very elite institute in the UK, I still couldn't actually access the things I needed to do my own research. And the more I thought about it, the worse it sort of became. And I began to learn about things like open access and open data, open peer review, open evaluation all of these different facets of what is generally called open, act, uh, open science now. And yeah, it's sort of, now I'm here um, with you all. So, you know, I'm, I'm rogue, as was said, I'm independent. So what are the things that motivate me in the morning? Like these are the big picture things that we're trying to solve. Like the fact that the vast majority of scholarly research is still a hostage uh, by private corporations. Around 75% of all published knowledge which should be available to humanity is owned by shareholders, essentially. Um, this disadvantages almost everyone on this planet, except for those who are fortunate enough to be in a very privileged position at a very elite institute, which probably includes most of us here. Um, these commercial giants, are they're ruthless racketeers. They have profit margins often in excess of 35 to 40% uh, which is even bigger than Apple and all the big oil companies. The product of this is that as a global research community or scholarly community, we are not communica uh, communicating our results effectively. And basically, so many massive issues that are affecting our planet are suffering as a result of this. I don't have a pointy thing, but hopefully this will be okay. So there are major barriers to the dissemination of scholarly knowledge. Copyright is a huge one. It's completely and utterly broken. It doesn't protect us as uh, content producers. It protects the profits of scholarly publishers. Often, we can't even access our own uh, research results and we are prohibited from sharing them due to uh, anachronistic copyright laws again. Often, we don't even know what we're, is we're buying until after we've bought it. So you can pay 40 bucks to access a research article and you have no idea what's actually in that if it will prove useful. And there's no way in hell else we're going to give you a refund for that. Um, and we have life-saving research. So you know, if you look at the most cancer research and global health research is still hidden behind paywalls. And the real question is, like, how is any of this helping science or, or research have an impact on the global challenges that we're facing? If you look at this in like a really broad scale picture, these are the sustainable development goals set by the World Health Organization. It includes things like uh, economic growth, um, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequality, clean energy, uh, combating uh, energy insecurity, water insecurity, and hunger and all of these things. And do you, if you believe that research can help us uh, achieve these goals or resolve these issues, then you must also acknowledge the corollary of that in that preventing access to research stops us from uh, achieving these goals. Does anyone disagree with that? Excellent. <laughs> but this is exactly the system which we're playing in. You have an industry that thrives on preventing access to knowledge. That's how it makes its money. Um, it's not a bug, that's a feature. You know, we often use the word systemic and it really is systemic and it's parasitic as well if you want to use an ecology term. One of the consequences of this is that public trust in research and expertise has plummeted over the last few years. Um, we see expertise effectively dismissed, especially from scholarly experts, you know, as if what we're doing is you know, no different than um, just Googling something. And like, I've, I've created like a hypothetical little conversation here, 
But this is like a very real thing. This sort of conversation happens like at the highest levels, like in Congress, when researchers go to present evidence, they get rejected because people are like, well, you know, isn't that research pub published in science or nature just fake, basically? And if you think about it, there's not really much reason why they shouldn't think that, because everything is closed. You know, imagine like this research paper, imagine an academic saying, this research paper has been published in a high impact journal. Well, someone can go, well, it's paywalled. I can't access it. Like, how do I know that the research is good or valid? When the academic says, well, it's been peer reviewed. And then the non-academic can say, well, you know, who peer reviewed it? What did they say? And you're like, well, we don't know because, you know, that's hidden. And they're like, OK, so why should we trust it? It's like, well, it's in a top journal. So like, well, well, what does that mean? Well, it's got a high impact factor. It's like, what on earth does that have to do with the quality of the research? It's like, Psh, you know, just trust us, OK? You know, this is good. It's legit. Um, but trust has to be earned, and trust is something that opacity does not breed. So in a world where, yeah, in, in a world where transparency breeds trust, we shouldn't actually be surprised when expertise is rejected because we're op operating within a closed system. And if we step outside of that system and look at it or empathize with those who are outside, then it actually almost makes perfect sense why we have a sort of chaotic relationship with members of the wider public at the moment. So... From what I can see in my like, seven years of being here, like, the ivory towers of academia are suddenly crumbling due to the wider open movement. But is it happening fast enough? And what are the consequences when it doesn't move fast enough? So what is open science? Like, there is actually no universally accepted definition of this. My one at the top is um, open science is about using science to help address the major challenges to society. But if you look at like Wikipedia and the European Commission, for example, they have very different definitions based on like the practice and diffusion and dissemination of research itself. There's no bigger target in process. It assumes that collaboration is fundamental um, to this. Ironically, if you look at the one systematic uh, review of what open science is, published by Elsevier and paywalled by them, it says that open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. So does that mean that open science excludes anything done by the individual? It's a pretty stupid definition, if you ask me. Um, but you can't read it anyway, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that. So you know, when, when people use the term open science, you know, often people will think, oh, they just mean you know, physics, biology, chemistry. But when I talk about open science, I mean it in like, the most inclusive sense possible. So often this is used interchangeably with open scholarship or open research. But we just have to make sure that we include everyone. So that includes humanists, social scientists, even artists, engineers, mathematicians, medics. Like everyone, in my view, is included, citizen scientists even, are included under this umbrella of what open science encapsulates. For me as well, like open science is based on core principles. Um, I've got this nice little table here from uh, Tony Ross Hallower. And this is a combination of sort of like practical aspects and personal aspects. Uh, behind open science. So for example, accessibility, equality, rigor is definitely you know, a practical aspect, but also some of the ones which you missed off like freedom, fairness, justice, and truth. And for me, like, if these are sort of principles that you adopt anyway as a good human being, like who doesn't agree with fairness and equality and inclusivity, then you're basically an open scientist anyway, or open scholar anyway. And you can embed the practices within your everyday life, or at least you should, uh, as a researcher, or at least you should be anyway. But like, on the practical aspect, open science is bloody complicated. Like, I don't want to hold that back. Like, this is uh, the rainbow of uh, open scholarship tools from Bianca Kramer and Jerome Boseman. And as you can see, it includes things like you know, search and discovery, analysis, writing, publication, all the way through to different tools used for assessment and evaluation. And it's complicated. Like, there are entire workflows here, which we sort of need to be trained at, but no one's really teaching us how to use. And it's complicated, right? I imagine, I don't know if you can see any of the little symbols on the right there. I imagine we're all aware of at least one of these and use them in our everyday lives. But like integrating open science into your everyday workflow as a researcher can be quite complicated. Um, another like really important question I think we need to ask is like how is open science objectively different to science? So I think that was supposed to be the title of my talk, but I changed it to something weirder. Um, so Mick Watson in 2015, 
he just wrote this beautiful little editorial called When Will Open Science Simply Become Science? So, you know, those principles and tools which I just mentioned, are they open science or just good science? Because for me, it's just good science. You know, Mick said, open science describes the practice of carrying out scientific research in a completely transparent manner, good science, and making the results of that research available to everyone. Isn't that just science? And like, it's difficult to disagree, really. And so when we talk about what open science is, it really is just better science. And the opposite of open science is just bad science. Because if you're not sharing in a transparent manner, then you're basically creating anecdotes rather than research itself. Um, a lot of people describe open science, though, as a movement. So a movement is defined as a group of people working together to advance their shared political, social, or artistic ideas. The implication of this is that a movement has a direction uh, with shared common goals based on commonality. Um, so if open science is a movement, then who is defining the direction? Who is defining the shared goals? What's the strategy behind it? Who's leading it? Is it Daria? Is it the open science framework? Is it EOSC? <laughs> and what happens to those who don't feel included within that movement? So a nice little example of this is like one time uh, I had to go to the Humboldt Institute with some uh, open science colleagues as part of a, an outreach workshop to teach them different methods of doing open science. And when we went, they actually ended up schooling us in doing something way better than what we were, what we were going to teach them using like virtual machine environments and all of these crazy things. And we were like, oh, cool. So you've basically already done like open science anyway. And they're like, yeah, but we just don't call it that. <laughs> right? It's kind of interesting. So like, is open science, you know, is it a process, a set of principles, a vision, a club, a political agenda, a fad, a distraction? Is it exclusive? And what happens when we as a supposed movement or community actually can't answer any of these questions? I think that's kind of important because, you know, it really gets to the root of what open science is and how is it objectively different to what we're doing anyway. And then that can help us to, to de define like a strategic direction for the future of what we actually want to achieve once we fall back upon that. Oh yeah, okay, right. So I think we're basically all academics here, right? Who hasn't heard of Publish or Perish? Excellent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, there's this mantra, Publish or Perish, right? But it, it, it's kind of dead. Like, there's no publish or perish anymore. It's publish and perish. Like, you can publish five papers during your grad school, and you'll still be told that you're not qualified enough to get a postdoc. Um, you know, there's too much competitiveness, too much funding, too many people coming in through the pipeline, being drilled into this sort of narrow ivory tower mindset of how to do academia. Um, as soon as we start, you know, one of the first things I was told when I became a PhD student is, yeah, within like your first like year or so, you better publish like a high impact paper. And I was like, dude, I don't even have any data yet. Like, come on, like chill. Um, I did, but you know, it was a lot of strain. Um, and it's a lot, yeah, it is a lot of stress to deal with. Like at Imperial, um, out of like the 50 or so PhD students as part of my cohort, pretty much every single one of them left with insomnia, alcoholism, uh, depression, anxiety or stress. You know, because they were basically being treated like farm animals, and it's because of this publish or perish mentality. Um, and yeah, we wonder why uh, PhD students um, have almost twice the amount of mental health issues as people who even work in like emergency health services, which is the second highest, right? Because we don't have any sort of support framework for that, and we're being grilled into a system which is completely, you know, crap, right? The publish and perish mentality. <coughs> and it's because as far as I'm concerned, of these sort of giant mega publishers. So, you know, we've heard of Springer and Elsevier et al. mentioned before. Um, you know, there's a great quote from the journalist George Monbiot. He said, academic publishers make Rupert Murdoch look like a socialist. I think that's a very positive outlook. Um, but it's also known as the industry the internet could not kill. Back in 1998, Forbes uh, wrote a really great editorial saying that Elsevier would be the internet's first victim. Elsevier went on then to like basically have unbounded profit uh, increases for the next, well, since until now, still, it's still ongoing. It's a tw like I've said, it's a $25 billion a year industry. It's extremely fat and bloated, and 35% profit margins are fairly, fairly typical. Um, you know, we still talk about papers. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's 2018, and we still refer to, <laughs> to, uh, to papers. 
And what we have at the moment for our, the vast majority of our scholarly communication process is a 19th century process of peer review applied to a 17th century communication format around journals and articles. Um, you know, we still mostly use PDFs as well. I think it's probably about time we adapted to the web of 1995 for scholarly communication because we're seriously lagging. Um, and it's a very strange system to be part of right now. Like, I'm sure we've all heard of Sci-Hub and ResearchGate as well. Well, these are essentially platforms that want to provide increased access to uh, scholarly research, but are viewed as pirate sites, as if you know, equating liberation of knowledge was equivalent to plundering and murdering. Um, and the American Chemical Society and Elsevier and their kin are suing them for millions of dollars and shutting them down, preventing access to this research. Um, so for some reason, sharing research is illegal. So have a think about that one. And you know, the more you know, the worse it gets. Like I mentioned, only 25% you know, uh, of all scholarly research articles are open access. And that comes after about 20 years after the Budapest Open Access Initiative. So we're increasing our rate of free access to knowledge at about 1% every year. So maybe in about 30 or 40 years, we'll finally have substantial access to research knowledge. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we have this prestige economy where your value as a researcher is based on the commercial brands dictated by corporate values, which you elect to publish in for whatever reason. There are various biases in this, like basically if you're a minority researcher or a woman or an early career researcher, then you're incredibly biased against from the offset. It's not great. Um, and as we all know, researchers write, review, and edit the papers, so around 95% of the real value behind scholarly communication. And then we have that content stolen away from us by publishers and then sold back to us. Um, it's fantastic. And then you wonder how they generate 40% profit margins. So like for researchers, it's like you know, going into a restaurant and bringing all of your own ingredients, cooking the meal yourself, and then being charged 40 bucks for a, a waiter to bring it out to you on a plate. Like, it's bullshit. <laughs> Or am I allowed to swear? <laughs> I did, too late. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the old saying is it's uh, smart people doing stupid things for smart reasons. And it's because, you know, our careers sort of depend upon this publish or perish mentality. That's why they call it that. But at the end of the day, we're basically being duped as a global research community. We are no longer researchers. We are the oil for the machine, so to speak, the provider, the product, and the consumer for this mega corporate uh, entity out there. You know, the market itself is incredibly dysfunctional, part of a, a wider oligopoly, similar to a mon monopoly. And yeah, we have life-saving research about cancer, Ebola, you know, Zika, all hidden behind paywalls, sold off to the highest bidder at the will of Elsevier's stakeholders. Um, and it's not fantastic. This will get back to open science at some point. <laughs> yeah, this, is, this has happened uh, two days ago as well. Uh, the Ebola outbreak was, what, four years ago? Nature finally decided to announce that it would provide open access for a limited period only to Ebola research. So round of applause to Springer Nature for acting four years after they were supposed to. <laughs> there. If anybody's not angry at scholarly publishers yet, then I'm clearly failing, because you should be. <laughs> you know, um, if we look again in Europe, who's, is anybody here from the Deal Consortium? Huh? Really? Okay, excellent. So in Germany, uh, you have a national library consortium who are currently revolting against the revolting practices of Elsevier and their kin. Um, it's fantastic. So the photo on the right there is taken from uh, a publishing conference they somehow let me into earlier this year in Berlin. Uh, he's the president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. And typically at these conferences, um, he is supposed to get up and give a nice speech about what a great job everyone's doing. Um, and, you know, Give them a little round of applause for being who they are. But this was a conference held by Elsevier and Springer Nature. And in fact, he followed the vice president of external relations of Elsevier onto the stage. And he spent about 15 minutes slamming the crap out of them in the most beautifully German way possible. <laughs> and he, he's actually on the chief, one of the chief negotiators behind Project Deal. Who were, they, he's actually in the room there negotiating these big deal uh, subscription uh, contracts with Elsevier et al. And you know, he was saying that he, he basically feels like he's been bullied half the time. You know, um, he said, you know, we don't want to pay Elsevier anymore because we don't see the value in what you're doing. And he says, one publisher, Elsevier, stated, it's like, if your country stops subscribing to our journals, 
science in your country will be set back significantly. And he responded, it is interesting to hear such a threat from a producer of envelopes who does not have any idea of the contents. <laughs> Pretty harsh, but <laughs> hilarious at the same time. <laughs> um, but either way, the way, whichever side you're on, and however you look at this, there are these enormous rifts happening in the world of scholarly communication at the moment. It's basically big publishers versus everyone else. Um, you know, they're entering the legal realm, uh, they influence copyright, career advancement, the structure of our research institutes. Um, and, you know, there are really deep issues happening here. And, yeah, there's a bit of a sort of like open science revolution is sort of infiltrating into many of these aspects. So, you know, Project Deal is causing quite a mess. Uh, in France, recently we had a very similar thing between the Cooperin Consortium and Springer Nature, where they served up the middle finger on a silver platter to them and said, we're not going to subscribe anymore. Cooperin have saved 12 million euros every year in subscriptions, which they're reinvesting into open scholarly infrastructure. If anyone here is from Cooperin, thank you. Uh, Sweden announced two or three days ago <laughs> that they're doing the same thing. They cancelled all subscriptions to Elsevier journals, and they're like, crap, we've got like, all of this money we've been wasting on journals for these last 30 years. Now what do we do with it? Um, and it's fantastic. And if you look in Taiwan, South Korea, Argentina, Mexico, they're all gearing up to do the same thing at the moment. Oddly, uh, just the UK who seem to be not too fond of this at the moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of the, one of the things is like we, we have so many awesome web-based technologies to app blow scholarly communication wide open. Like, why on earth are we still, you know, communicating in PDFs, um, articles with thumbnail-sized images when we have an entire web at our fingertips? Like, I assume we all know about tools like GitHub and Stack Exchange and Wikipedia. Why not use something like the moderation or editing system of Wikipedia combined with the uh, reward structure behind Stack Exchange, combined with the version control of GitHub in order to create a fully like, integrated, community-owned, very cheap, open scholarly communication system? And before anybody says it can't be done, people are doing this already. Um, I'm not sure if they are in digital humanities, but you know, there are you know, communities like computer scientists who are certainly doing these sorts of things already. Which brings me on to penguins. <laughs> so, so cultural inertia defines academia. Uh, it's a crowd-based physiological effect, and it pervades all aspects of the academy. Now, if you uh, have you ever met like the average academic, like 50% of them are stupider than the average academic. That's st statistically a fact. <laughs> um, you know, and we have this publish or perish mentality. And they're generally terrified of new technologies. Like, it took me about a year just to even set up a GitHub profile, even though I knew it was going to be amazing. But we're also really, really bad at making predictions. Like, 10 years ago, people said open access is never going to happen. Eight years ago, people said open data is never going to happen. Three or four years ago, people said open peer review is never going to happen. Now people are saying preprints are never going to happen. It's like, yeah, you, you, you keep, keep on that roll. You're doing really well there with those predictions, because all of these aspects of open science are happening in some sort of way, um, in one form or another. And it's fantastic. But like in doing so, we've created like a whole range of new technical, social, and language barriers around these new developments. And that's a bit of a problem, because we like to think that openness is supposed to be inclusive, right? It's one of the key finding principles. But is that actually the reality? Like, Have we created a new system that's open for some and not open for all? I would argue yes. Um, <coughs> And one of the reasons for this is that there are immense barriers to change within academia. You know, we have you know, a suite of social, cultural, technological, political, organizational, all of these things create vast barriers to each of us on an individual or community level to actually progress in a way in which we think is most beneficial to, to our communities. You know, three of the, the biggest stifling uh, effects are fear, particularly for uh, the most underprivileged. Uh, competition because we all want to advance our careers and the abuse of power dynamics from those at the top. All of this uh, creates what I've apparently called inerty, but meant to call uh, in inertia <laughs> here, which prohibits change. I really need my pointy thing. Oh dear, that's gone horribly. But yeah, if you look at like the values that are driving open science, it's things like how to reduce publication bias, how to increase access to knowledge, how to make research more efficient and reliable, um, you know, how to make it more sustainable and how to foster collaboration. And almost every one of the barriers which you look at, um, which prevents us, revolves around fear. So for example, fear of being scooped or 
fear of information overload or fear of poor research quality, uh, fear of errors and public humiliation. That's a big one for, for grad students. But yeah, it's this concept of fear. And, and this is where the penguins come in because <laughs> you know, researchers are like penguins. So penguins spend most of our day huddled up together on an ice cap. And eventually they all start to get a little bit hungry and they look longingly at the water and we're like, food is out there, but so are killer whales. And no one wants to be the first one to jump in the water because they're afraid of being eaten. But eventually one of them gets so hungry that he slides off down the, uh, the iceberg into the water and goes hunting for fish and he's very happy. And then all of the others are like, oh, well, you know, he was safe, so maybe we can go down too. And eventually, one by one, they all start sliding down and they go off and no one gets eaten. Well, sometimes someone gets eaten, but you know, <laughs> that, that's life. But yeah, it's the same as academics, right? There's like new technologies and new processes and things coming out and everyone's terrified of being the first one to jump. Yeah, and it's, you know, due to fear. And this fear is coupled with the fact that we're almost singularly only awarded for you know, um, gaining academic capital based on the journals that we've published in. So we have an industry that relies on creating the stifling effect over innovation and progression of our field. Um, yeah, so we're, we're generating a lot of value for them, but we're also losing out uh, as a global research community in the process. And, you know, people talk about um, providing incentives to do open science or, you know, sticks and carrots and all of these conversations um, to make people do better science. But, you know, it's kind of missing the point that we should actually just be doing good science in the first place, right? We shouldn't need to be incentivized to not be transparent about our work. Like, that's the completely wrong way of looking at things. Um, in my view, anyway. But, yeah, that's, that's why the penguin analogy sort of works. The next one's cobras. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the COBRA analogy is about uh, key performance indicators and how having perhaps like a performance-based evaluation system, you know, revolving typically around publication, is that damaging to academia and to, to global scholarly research? Well, I would argue again, yes. And I, I call this the, the COBRA effect. So, there's this really well-known anecdote about when the British uh, ruled India, I say ruled, occupied India, sorry, so uh, in Delhi, uh, you had administrative officials uh, who were concerned that there were too many cobras in Delhi. So they created a new, a new policy that members of the populace would be given uh, money in exchange for any cobras, with dead cobras, that they bought them. So in return, the locals were like, ooh, what if we just like farmed cobras and bred cobras, killed them and took them to the British and got lots of money for it? And they did. So. They did, yeah, they started breeding like thousands and thousands and thousands of cobras and then, you know, they got a lot of money back for them. And the British, they were like, wait a minute, something's not right here. They find out that some of the locals were farming cobras and they're like, right, that's it. You're not allowed to do this anymore. Let all the cobras go. And they did. So all the cobras were let loose and the population boosted and there was a crisis. You know, so this is a policy designed to cull the number of cobras but led to a population boom in the end. Um, and the same thing happens in science as well. If you look at you know, how we're rewarded based around things like citations and the impact factor of the journals we publish in, that's what we, uh, what we end up aiming for. And there's another great paywalled article which came out last year where it looked at this sort of effect in Italian researchers. And what it found was that within four years after the Italian research uh, councils or whatever, um, put in a policy saying that citations were, be were going to become important uh, in research assessment, it led to a maximum of a 179% increase in the number of self-citations of research. So it was the, a great idea executed in the wrong way and led to an unintended consequence. Um, and it's called Goodhart's Law, right? Have we, has anybody heard of this? It's like when, when, a, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So when you set something like high impact journals as the target for researchers, they're like, how do we get into high impact journals? Oh, we have to you know, tell a really good story. We have to get better data for our work. And that skews the research process because the research process should never be about aiming for a high impact publication. It should be about discovery of truth, right? But we've skewed that. Oh, and I do have a Rick and Morty thing apparently. Uh, yeah, so this is the game. And you know, the people always respond saying, well, you know, this is just a system that we're part of, but the system comprises of people. 
right? So anybody who is sort of complicit in citation gaming should be accountable for those actions. Um, yeah. And in fact, if you look at this, it's like it's almost you know the fact that we are rewarded for high impact journals is completely the wrong way around anyway. Because if you look at peer review in the top journals, it's of typically a lower quality. The research has the highest probability of being retracted, um, not due to more eyes, but due to the probability that researchers have committed fraud in order to get into those journals. Um, and that's it really, like top journals mean worse research, nothing to do with the quality of research itself, apart from the inverse, sorry, the inverse of what we expect. So like one thing I, I, I tell researchers is like if you use the impact factor to uh, evaluate the quality of another person's research or of an individual researcher, then all of your papers that use any form of statistics should be retracted because you sure as hell don't know a thing about statistics. And that's a powerful message to tell people, especially in senior positions, right? I'm, I'm junior and I sort of poke away at this sort of thing and people in this room can do the same thing too. Does anyone disagree with that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like, how does open science factor into this? So like, yeah, look at like the use of alt metrics and article level metrics. Um, don't just use one crap proxy to evaluate you know, an incredibly complex system of research. I think that's fairly bog standard. You know, if you haven't signed the San, Fra uh, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment or looked at things like the Leiden Manifesto yet, these should be high up on your agenda to, to look at right now. Um, but ultimately, it's down to the individual researcher to stop breeding cobras because, you know, that just contributes to a worse system. And now you get to find out about Gimli. Has anybody not seen Lord of the Rings? Okay. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a scene there where, towards the end of the movie, against all hope, <laughs> the last of the good guys go to march on the gates of the bad guys. And, you know, it's uh, a no-hope a no hope situation. And, you know, they're basically all consigning themselves to death. And Gimli says, certainty of death, small chance of success. What are we waiting for? And they all march off and they don't die, but some of them do again. Um, and it's another perfect analogy for academia because... We're told this sort of story at the moment that you can't do various aspects of open science because they will harm your career. And that's due to these social and technical barriers that we sort of mentioned before. Um, the effect of that sort of divergent attitude which is being imposed upon us is that people who want to innovate and explore and create or do good science are chased out of the system. The effect of that is that the status quo and all of those who it's training are, uh, lives on in per perpetuity and the research cycle suffers. And this is true. So I think there's probably about 100 of you in this room. Um, statistically, only half of one of you will actually get a full-time professorship, assuming that you're all grad students, which I think you all are. But like, this is research done in the UK, and it showed that out of the entire PhD cohort, only 0.45%, so one in 200, will ever get a full-time career. So this goes back to what I was saying. Like, you know, you can be taught the publish or perish mentality, but the statistics say that you're going to perish anyway. So, <laughs> you know, forget about playing the game. Um, like, why would you try and be like the worst version of yourself to get a job that you're not going to get? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and it's, but it's this cycle, right? We feel like we're forced to play the game um, because, you know, anything outside of academia is perceived as failure, which is awful in itself. But this leads to a reinforcement of the power imbalances, um, cultural inertia, commercial interests end up governing, and the cycle continues. Uh, I need to skip on, I think, a little bit. Boop, doop, doop. Yeah, bringing it back to open science, like, can, can we break this cycle through training? It's a tough question. So if you look at some of the research around this, there was a paper published last year, and it showed that 60.8% um, of research articles published in global health uh, journals the researchers did not self-archive those articles, even though it was free and within keeping with journal policy. So this is life-changing research, which researchers themselves are not sharing, even though they're fully enabled to do so. And you know, in a field where you think access to knowledge would be kind of important for saving people's lives, you have to ask the question, why are those researchers not doing that? And it's the same at different levels too. Like if you look in the UK, uh, was it? 93% of researchers in the UK, on roughly, believe that open access is important. 
but less than half of that number have actually published in an open access journal. So why again is this, there this massive divergence? I honestly don't know. Like it just, it blows my mind that researchers can promote one thing with one hand and then fail to uphold their own values. And I, I don't understand why, because all of the evidence points towards like actually being open, enhancing your career. So for example, if you publish in an open access journal, statistically you will gain increased citations. The same can be said if you share your data and you share your code openly, you make your work more reusable, therefore more open to being cited. And in a system where, you know, Cobras count still, this is a good thing for you. And a lot of people will counter this by saying open access is too expensive. It's like, if you say that, all you're doing is telling me that you can't Google properly because, you know, self-archiving costs nothing. There are so many routes out there to free instantaneous sharing that help to sort of level the playing field for everyone here. Um, and you know, it's, it's this, has anybody ever came across this raincoat analogy? It works perfectly for research. So, you know, what we have is this thing called the internet where anyone can share any of their research instantly and freely online. It's dead easy. And then we had like these policies and mandates come in saying, oh, now you have to publish your work open access. And then publishers swooped in and said, we'll give you open access for $3,000 a pop. And the guy said, the green raincoats is just there like, you can have this for free. Why aren't you doing this? Like, it's the raincoat analogy. And it works perfectly for, as an analogy between gold and green open access. Why would you pay three, four, five thousand dollars for something that you can get for free? Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip forward. Preprints are amazing. Share preprints. Again, like, research shows that if you're a you know, junior researcher, it's generally good for your career because you generate more citations faster uh, and ultimately at a, fa yeah, at a faster rate. And yeah, that's a good thing. And you get free rapid communication for your research. There's an explosion of venues in order to do this over the last five uh, months or so. I think there's some like 36 different preprint servers these days, including like Sosh Archive and Humanities Commons. Like the, the concept here is like, it's your own work. Like don't, just don't stick it behind a paywall. Like you, you do have choices to publish it where you want. And the future is definitively going open. So on the, on the left, we have the exponential increase in the rise of preprints across different fields at the moment. And on the right, uh, the number of open access policies adopted by Quarter in the EU. And as you can see, they're both on the rise. Openness isn't going anywhere. So you might as well ride that wave. Um, so yeah, you know, as far as I'm concerned, like, you know that little graph I showed you earlier about open science being divergent from your career? I think it's time to change the conversation because open science is pretty awesome. Like it increases the dissemination of your research and the reusability, ultimately enhances your academic profile, which is good for you. Um, helps to combat the reproducibility crisis and it makes you a better researcher. I'll skip out the little bit about me. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, instead of it being this, which is what we're taught, um, it's actually this. But we need that first step. We need to take responsibility and educate ourselves about open science or good science in order to use that to enhance our careers and it won't act against us. And yeah, this is one of the reasons why I'm building this open science MOOC is to help with training and support and education for researchers around the world in uh, all of these practices. And we're gonna hopefully use this to empower the next generation to become leaders in their own research fields. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I think I have one or two wrap up slides. Yeah, but there, there, there are challenges. So like, you know, we need to uh, not just act within our own little communities, but act across them to, to increase like interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity, uh, community building. You know, I, I'm honored to be here with humanists and social scientists because I don't get to speak to you very often. And I know that at the conferences I go to, I know that humanists and social scientists often aren't invited. And I think that's a real problem that we seem to have like this gulf between physical science and HSS. Um, yeah, do do do. But yeah, I think the previous talk also nailed it at the uh, end of his talk, uh, end of his thing as well. Like, you know, we need to be working together, like build bridges, not walls. So like open science for me is about breaking down barriers in science, about equity and things like that, things which can help us to foster collaboration and increase the power of communities against the entrenched, you know, crap, which we're all trying to fight against, um, which means that we have to work together towards a common goal, ultimately. Um, and that common goal for me is, you know, pooling knowledge and resources to create a decentralized scholarly infrastructure 
with communities like you as the actual focus. And then we can actually achieve the principles of open science together uh, as a community. So in future, like when people say, you know, what do penguins, cobras and Gimli have to do with open science? So with penguins, you know, don't let fear hold you back from trying new things. Um, be one of those people who jumps out into the water first because, you know, you'll be remembered amongst your community as a champion. Uh, the Gimli effect, you know, the career pipeline's leaky anyway, so why not diversify your skill set? Um, go out as an awesome researcher, guns blazing, or train yourself to become an awesome researcher through open scientific practices, predicting where the future of your field is going to be, rather than doing what Professor X tells you to do 50 years ago. And in Cobras, instead of farming Cobras, focus on good science and responsible evaluation, and let the quality of your research speak for itself. And in doing so, you know, we'll look back upon this time and we'll say, you know, what, what is open science? It's a tautology, right? Science was always open. Like, this is where we want to get to. In, in 10 years, we don't want open science to exist because it's, this is going to be the period when we sort of woke up um, and realized that what we were doing before wasn't science, really. It was anecdote. Um, and we need to change that. So, yeah, science without open is just anecdote. Open science is just good science. That's your take-home message. <laughs>